My name is Gina Patnayak, and I'm a graduate student in the English department here at Berkeley. My dissertation is on post-conflict narratives in the 20th century. And for the past five years, I've been working to help create the human rights minor here on campus. And thinking about, I guess, the types of the types of goals that the university sets for itself. And so one of the set of images that I became very interested in were the images of people, individual images of people. So you have, um, for example, Charles Dam, the physicist in charge of the Alice Group at Livermore, sort of peeping through his machinery. As Adams is trying to think about how to, how to represent the work of the university. Um, and, and the types of knowledge production that go on here. He chooses to render people through their work. And I mean that quite literally, that people are often shown in images where machines or their work product are in front of them, and then they themselves sort of hover behind it. It's a very interesting choice to me. And you see sort of both the thrill of these new types of technologies, um, but also the people behind the work product itself. I think that the choice to show people and their work um, also points to one of the continual struggles with the university, um, which, uh, it's sort of how to represent the work of the sciences and the work of the humanities. If one way of representing the university is to think through the types of research interests that compose you know, faculty research in the university, another way would be to think of it as a, as a teaching institution. Um, and so, one of the images that uh, that really drew me uh, was this image of a a faculty member holding class in his home um, it, at Riverside. Uh, and the caption reads: Robert Hine, associate professor of history, conducts an undergraduate class in, in the American West in his living room. As you look at the image, you realize that instead of foregrounding the object of study or the object of creation with the faculty member standing behind it, in this image, Adams is, is just as close to the back of the faculty member's head as he could be, almost sharing his perspective um, while still allowing him to be a part of the, a part of the image. And, and instead, what, what it displayed are the students who are all, in turn, looking back. Uh, at the faculty member and almost, by dint of where Adams is standing, almost back at the lens. The students all look fairly engaged, they're all smiling. There's also, if you look closely, uh, there are these punch glasses with with uh, cookies and punch on them. So it's a, it's a social occasion <laughs> as well as an, uh, as an occasion for learning. Uh, there's a woman smoking a cigarette, there's a uh, a man chomping on his pipe. The caption sort of on the opposing page is a quote from a former provost of Riverside who's speaking to a very different sort of understanding of the educational process um, from some of the other images that have been displayed. Part of what he writes is, uh, we desired also to turn out men and women of refined manners, possessing compulsive urges to creative living, conscious of the need for constructive service to the nation and mankind. Uh, and I think while well, we could probably debate the ultimate value of refined manners <laughs> as an educational enterprise, um, one of the things that it captured for me was the way in which um, he's trying to articulate a version of a sort of Jeffersonian vision of education, which cultivates um, not just scholars but citizens, um, and the types of um, the types of learning that exist in in unexpected spaces outside of the classroom um, and in conversations that perhaps don't have to do precisely with a syllabus that are allowed to unfold naturally. As I was showing this collection to several friends of mine, uh, we realized we all had uh, in some ways a very remarkable experience, uh, perhaps not in a professor's uh, living room, uh, but we all had the experience of of connecting with faculty as as undergraduates um, in informal ways that uh, that really shaped our understanding uh, of what it meant to live in the academy and to have that be an engaging uh, academic and social uh, experience. The types of moments where I think of learning happening on campus, I guess as a student, that sort of has been my experience of the campus as this as this place where you meet um, people that you've never encountered before, whose interests really spark your own or challenge your own. And I think that that, um, that is one of the things that as the university expands is perhaps slipping away. 
I think I covered the pictures that I wanted to talk about. Oh, I didn't talk about the teaching machine, which was, which I like a lot. The text that accompanies uh, the images heralding the advance of new forms of technology and the, the types of impact that that technology can have on learning. It begins to describe the computer as a quote, teaching machine. And, and in the text, it actually appears in Scarecrows as well, perhaps suggesting uh, the author's own uh, hesitancy to fully claim uh, the computer as a replacement uh, or, or a machine as, um, as a proper venue for, for academic instruction. The writer is describing the teaching machine as the container for all that teachers have learned about teaching since Socrates, whose dialogue is the essential principle of the teaching machine. The computer, as teaching device, can go beyond the Socratic dialogue and give the student himself the capability of discovering new knowledge and simultaneously projecting it to applied problems. This text was very rich uh, in the ways that it, it both positions uh, the computer as as the direct ancestor of sort of every type of philosophical tradition um, up until the present moment, but then imagining education as a way around Socratic dialogue itself, right? Um, so that it could really just be the student in front of uh, in front of a machine. The thing that that struck me about that is um, is sort of is something that speaks very much, I think, to the present moment that we're in um, as we're trying to figure out the ways that technology can be used to make the classroom experience more accessible, more, um, more open. Um, it seems that uh, the, the warning that, that the text itself gives in placing the teaching machine in scarecrows is one that we could do well to heed today, um, to think about uh, exactly, exactly what it is we do as, um, and what it is we lose. Um, as we turn away from the classroom itself and the types of communicative experiences uh, that, that unfold um, spontaneous, uh, often unexpected um, types of conversations that happen uh, that are often so central to, the, to our understanding of, um, of the educational experience here.